Most business traveler, your master world debit card opens doors to luxurious experience at all Indian and international airport lounge services. We believe business is good when it is mixed with a little room for recreational activity. And a bit of pampering. So we make ourselves available at your doorstep whenever you need our expert assistance. Join us for a joyful and a memorable journey. Welcome to Baroda Radios. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please request you to take your respective seats. We are about to begin our next session. Can I please request gentlemen standing on the left of the stage to please take their seats. We are about to begin with the next session. Can I please request you to kindly take your seats? We do not have any reserved seatings for the session. Can I please request you to kindly take the front rows? I request all delegates to kindly shift to the front rows. There are no reserved seatings for this particular session.
ladies and gentlemen, I, a very warm welcome once again to the next session, which is on technology and innovation with a special focus on startups. I would like to invite our panelists on stage, Ms. Sona Pradeep, Deputy Director, Global Innovation and Technology Alliance, Mr. K. Padmanabhan, Chief Advisor, UCAL Fuel Systems Limited, Chennai, Mr. Lee Monjue, Country Head, Yosma Group, Mr. Kim Daijin, President, Global Entrepreneurs Foundation, Mr. Raj Rajan Navnani, Chairman, CII Future Business Council and Managing Director, Jetline Group of Companies, and Mr. P.S. Jayakumar, Managing Director and CEO, Bank of Baroda. I would like to thank all panelists for joining us today. I now invite Ms. Sona, Deep, Sona Pradeep for a welcome remark and overview on industry-led R&D funding through India Republic of Korea Joint Applied R&D Program. Ms. Sona. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all the business delegates coming here all across from Korea, our Indian representatives and eminent panel of speakers on the days. During my presentation today, I will cover, I will cover mostly on the research and development landscape of India and basically the R&D uh, bilateral country program between India and Republic of Korea, the bilateral mechanism that is existing, and for joint applied research and development, in which the projects have been funded so far, will be explained in detail. Uh, to set the background on R&D landscape in India, it is important to know how scientific policy making in India has evolved over a period of time. The earlier policy, which dated back in 2003, which was named as Science and Technology s and Policy, and now the new policy of which is termed as Science, Technology and Innovation Policy has a component of innovation added to the latest policy formulation which itself means that there is a component of involvement of business and industry to contribute to R&D. For India, the paradigm of innovation is about presenting improved s and based solutions to drive social and economic development. Therefore, the key focus of the new STI policy is to encourage the R&D output with societal and commercial applications. The policy brings education, research, and innovation together for the first time, and thus creating, converting knowledge into money. So uh, with this objective in mind, Government of India uh, extended support to Indian industry and academic R&D institutions for industry-led collaborative projects, technology acquisitions, deployments for various bilateral and national R&D programs and schemes through the incorporation of GITA, which is Global Innovation and Technology Alliance, uh, which was formally incorporated on 29th November 2011 by Technology Development Board of Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, and Confederation of Indian Industry. So basically, it's a joint government and industry think tank and act tank and uh, Gita is also proud that uh, it was launched by and blessed by the chief guest uh, former president of India and late Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam during the National Technology Day on 11th May 2012. Therefore Gita is envisioned to technically and administratively manage government programs 
with active industry participation. Clearly, Gita's mandate is focused on providing funding support by way of grant, conditional grant and soft loans to promote industrial R&D, innovation and technology acquisition. Also to build capacity by offering specialized information, matchmaking, IP protection in the areas of technology design and IPR management. Also thereby strengthening the innovation ecosystem of the nation and also Gita is mandated to facilitate the implementation of various innovative and revolutionary scientific and technological research and development projects worldwide. Over a period of close to over six years of Gita's incorporation, uh, the canvas of Gita's activities has uh, strengthened from going beyond bilateral country programs to multilateral programs and national programs. So I'll briefly touch upon, you know, uh, within bilateral country programs, Gita has been doing the project management work and also catering to, um, you know, managing government's funds of Department of Science and Technology and Ministry of Electronics and IT, METIS, of Government of India for doing several industrial R&D between India and apart from Republic of Korea, we have six other national uh, bilateral country programs with Canada, UK, Spain, Italy, Finland, and Israel. And the programs in pipeline for bilateral R&D program, which is industry-led, is uh, for which is uh, due in due course of time, it will be launched, is with countries Australia, Brazil, and Norway. Besides this, uh, Gita has also been um, managing several EU-related projects called as Eno Indigo, which stands for Innovation Driven Initiative for Collaboration in R&D between Indian and European Research, which involves, which focuses on involvement of SMEs, uh, clusters, and network of excellence. Besides this, Gita is also managing an Enterprise Europe network which is an, a networking uh, platform for SMEs, basically, uh, to come up for technology and research offers and uh, uh, R&D activities with, within that network, networking platform. Besides this, Gita is also um, implementing various national country programs in which uh, it, is, it may not be necessarily an R&D pro program, but it, uh, the government's funds are basically for technology acquisition and development projects, and in which uh, Gita is working with several departments of government of India, namely Department of Heavy Industry DHI, which has a scheme called Technology Acquisition Fund Program, called as TAFP, in which uh, government's funds, DHI's funds, is for capital goods sector. Uh, uh, for a range of maximum of rupees 10 crores and uh, up to an extent of 25% of the Indian project cost for technology acquisition from within India or outside India, this funds is available. Um, then there is uh, an ongoing project called a uh, scheme called as Technology Development Fund Scheme of uh, DRDO, Defense Research and Development Organization of Ministry of Defense in which government's funds to the tune of rupees 10 crores maximum and 95%, uh, this is a very lucrative scheme for Indian industry and for the first time, Defense has opened up such a scheme for Indian industry to contribute to making uh, futuristic technologies and contribute to Defense uh, for government of India. So um, in this scheme, there is a, a grant provided up to 95% of the Indian project cost will be borne by um, DRDO through the scheme. Apart from this, there is also a scheme called as Technology Acquisition and Development Fund, TADF, of Ministry of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises of Government of India. Although the scheme currently is, non, uh, is, is not open, but in due course of time, we'll have more information about the scheme and its modalities. Uh, these are 
Gita's counterpart implementing agencies. And when we talk about Republic of Korea, uh, our counterpart for Gita in Korea is National Research Foundation of Korea. And there are several other, like I said, in the bilateral country programs. There are seven country programs that Gita manages. And our counterpart implementing agencies are, are as mentioned here. So the general program structure of bilateral or any national scheme is like this, that a lead industry from India plus academic and R&D institution from India uh, has to jointly put up a project proposal along since it's a bilateral country program so it's is required it is required that a collaborative project between Indian partners and the partners from the counterpart country also partner country also applies and where from India the lead partner has to be industry for which for such joint technology development project the funding from government of India via Department of Science and Technology or Ministry of Electronics and IT is up to 50% of Indian project cost. And the focus areas for these sectors are generally under these headings, technology areas related to affordable healthcare, advanced manufacturing, capital goods sector, robotics, and so on. So when we talk specifically about this program, called as India-Republic of Korea Joint Applied R&D Program. So the types of projects which are eligible for providing financial support are joint R&D, it has to be firstly a joint research and development project. A joint deployment through pilot production should be aimed so that there is a commercialization plan clearly at the end of the R&D. Products should be innovative, user-based, and market-driven leading to new products or processes and eventual commercialization. The duration of the project has to be um, not more than two years. That is uh, usually 24 months is what we say. Focus areas of the project should be in the areas considered by GST and in discussions with the counterpart ministry in Republic of Korea. So, um, and participation of academic and R&D lab is desirable, but we do not say that it is mandatory to put up a project application. And DST provides funding support by, by way of conditional grant up to 50% with a limit of 1.5 crores per project of the approved Indian project budget. So this is how our RFP, request for proposal under India Republic of Korea for 2017 look like with the launch date and the focus sectoral areas and the grant funding mentioned. For more details, you may please visit our uh, Gita website or please be in touch with the officials mentioned in the website for more details about each of these proposals. So, so far, we have, through this scheme, through this um, R&D program between India and Republic of Korea, we have, Gita has been able to provide funding support to five different projects uh, which has a focus areas between clean technologies, there is one, and three projects under robotics and automation, and one project under re renewable energy which has been provided funding support to this program. So briefly, I will just touch upon what these projects basically cater to and the project partners from the Indian side and Republic of Korea project partners. The first project that we that we provided funding support was for a project titled Development of Innovative Gasification Technology with tar-free and purified producer gas for uh, municipal solid waste, RBF, with Indian project partners as Trojan Pass Private Limited, Sikandrabad, and from the Korea side, it is Samho Environment Tech and Yonsei University. Um, the second project which was uh, awarded under this uh, program has been LNT Services, Bangalore, along with their academic partners as PSG College of Technology, Mysore, and project partners being RASTEC and KAIST University. Uh, the project was related to robotics. We'll have one project which we have picked up from this uh, 
uh, funded project under India Republic of Korea program for which we'll have detailed presentation coming up just after this presentation. So uh, you will have more details about how uh, this project, the contours of these project and what are the areas that uh, the funding support was provided through DEEP. So thank you all. That's it. Thank you, Sona. I now request uh, Mr. K. Padmanabhan, Chief Advisor, UCAL Fuel Systems, to join us for a brief case study of projects supported under India-Korea Joint Applied R&D Program. Good afternoon, everybody. Very, very briefly, over just five minutes, I will make a presentation as a representation of a project that we have carried out under the Indo-Korea joint program that Sungna explained. Basically, it is an autonomous amphibian vehicle, uh, which is an in India Republic of Korea joint application. As you would see, GITA is an implement Indian implementation agency, uh, along with uh, the Department of Science and Technology. And we do have the Republic of Korea funding agency on the other side and the Republic of Korea implementing agency. As Sona mentioned, there are um, the basic thing is an industry and an academic partner from India work along with an industry and an academic partner from Korea so that they discuss an innovative idea and come up with something where both have complementary strengths to each other. And then they say we could do this program which will be relevant to both the nations and which is also commerciable. So the abstract is uh, basically it is the design and development of an autonomous amphibious. Amphibious means it can go in water too. Unmanned aerial vehicle, so it's an UAV. It's basically the purpose is for real-time water quality assessment. However, as you are all aware, UAV is basically a platform. Once uh, defined for a particular purpose, it's also possible that similar applications can be based on using the same UAV. So I have mentioned at the things, in general, it's a, it has a 30 kg of weight takeoff, 7 kg of a payload, which is basically a camera. It can fly for 30 minutes, and it can go for 3 kilometers of the range. So if you presently generally look at the opportunities of a UAV where it's applied, it has two factions. One is to say that it goes on the air and primarily captures certain photographs. And what is very, very unique about this is that it has a combination of an amphibious too that can, because of the application, we need to go in water and take some water samples for the various studies. So it has got ability to function autonomously and carry out missions on land and water. Integrated sensor system for onboard real-time water quality analysis, both on-time and real-time. Uh, modularity, stability, and robustness to facilitate the intended missions. Uh, well, as I mentioned, that being the basic purpose, it can be used for crop monitoring, mapping, surveillance, everything as a base operational thing. So now, uh, yeah. so I'll just give a, present, a small video of a couple of minutes which will give the purpose.
So, as we are talking, we are uh, midway in the program. We have completed a year. Uh, there has been a significant interaction between the Korean team and the Indian team. Every week we talk to them on a WebEx, and uh, you know, initially we need to obviously circumvent a bit of issues like language and culture. But all that has now been completely surmounted. We act as a single team, though we are spread across uh, nearly 3,000 miles. We are working together. And um, the, the team visits from there every six months, and then we are on our uh, visit now. We have already made the structure and various aspects in India. We are taking it in another 10 days to uh, Korea to get the uh, autopilot integrated there and use the water sampler and do a week's test. This is a great, great um, experience for both of us from this side and the other team. Not only the two industries, but also the two academics. I think projects of this nature will greatly bring India to a definitive innovative sphere in new frontiers of technology. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would now like to call upon Mr. Lee Wanjie uh, to talk about building blocks of the Korean innovation ecosystem and opportunities for Indian startups. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I want to say to you, namaste, thank you. Um, I'm very pre privileged to be here. As you see me, uh, I'm a Korean, but actually I'm from Israel. I'm just uh, four years in, in Korea. I spent all my time in Israel. Then I had a great opportunity to learn about the Israel and uh, its ecosystem as well. Uh, first of all, uh, Yosma Group is the Israel's first venture capital fund that uh, we established from 1993 in Israel. As you see, this is one of the pictures. This is not far away from my hometown, just five minutes from my home, uh, near the Jerusalem. As you see, this, that is a picture. This is what uh, more than 70 percent of the Israel is uh, made by the desert. No resources, no water, and no gas is a uh, very lack of resources. So at the time of 1919, Israel has a very uh, serious economic crisis because the unemployment ratio is going up. All the graduate school and the uh, university, uh, they couldn't have the, the, the jobs. So at the 1919, at the time, the prime minister, the Israel Labin, and the older, the older minister, how to make Israel as the kind of startup nation, how to make a job boosting? So at the time, who was the, the chief scientist of the Israel, OCS, uh, who is now is a uh, chairman of the uh, Yuzma Group, he, uh, he gave us kind of the ideas. If to turn the Israel as the startup nation to make the, uh, the job boosting, it should be make the global network in Israel. So Prime Minister asked how to make a global network. So we did it through the making the funds. So we, that's why how we started to making the Yosma Fund. Yosma Fund is, as a fund of fund, the bringing all the foreign funds uh, to Israel. Because, the, as you see, investment is not just investing, giving the money. Investment is actually coming with all the uh, experience and all the network, actually. So those foreign funds came through the Yosma Fund, invested technology-based Israel companies. So they gave them global network and gave in the open way to the other country. So that's why uh, two industry companies, the portfolio we invested, went to the NASDAQ. And uh, through the fund of fund, more than 80 companies and uh, Israeli companies are listed the NASDAQ. That's how, how Israel started and made the globalization through the fund of fund as a, the foreign funds. And also the other thing is, uh, Israel made this special technology incubator program in 1919. So they made it 24 technology incubators. That's why they uh, help the commercialization of the technology startups in Israel. So uh, we started from 1993, and uh, we managed a fund until 2014. But uh, before we uh, having the 2014, uh, our chairman and founder was very interested in going to the Asian market, especially to the emerging market. So that's why one of the countries that we chose is uh, South Korea. 
The reason that we chose South Korea is uh, because of the uh, technologies. A lot of IPs in terms of properties is coming out from the institute and as well. So that's why we, we decided to, uh, to make the technology incubators so in Korea. So that's why we are managing seven technology incubators. Technology incubator is a very important way to uh, match the, between the, uh, the startup, startups. So now we are actually incubating the companies, but after incubating the companies, we have another homework. We have to send them the global market. So that's why we are collaborating the, uh, the other countries, accelerator and Greece and Israel. If you see, those are the, our portfolios that we invest in Israel. But you can amaze it that all the, most of the companies are very, very early stage companies. Those companies come from the university, come from the hospitals, come from the universities. Also, most of them are students or professors. But our technology incubators actually help them, they turn them that ideas to commercialize it, to make it happen to their startups. And second step they did is they got the foreign investment and the foreign investor helped them actually go into the US market or EU market. That's why uh, the several resorts we have is uh, the went to the Nasdaq and the London and the other countries. So what do I wanted our business here in, in Korea, that's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure that our first agenda is uh, talking about the, the making blocks for the innovation between India and the Korean countries. I think most important thing is uh, the strategy is to make in the collaborations. But uh, doing the MOU or partnership, I don't think it's enough. But how we did in Israel from 19 that uh, we, t we uh, succeeded from the listing to NASDAQ is only after we did the joint ventures. So I think the, the good technology base of the Korean companies with the good technology base of the Indian companies, if we, those organizations are doing the kind of matchmaking them together, so those are two companies that can have two uh, global market. One is the Korean market, second is the Indian market, which is very huge. And third thing is I want to really, really insist that most important thing in those days is not just the technology. Also in India, every country has a very good technology. But the important thing is not just the technology. The important thing is what is the technology trend? Actually, more the top five of venture capital in the world, they are looking at the following the technology trends. We have to know which conglomerate, real big companies are looking for that technology. But who knows that information? mostly a uh, foreign venture capital fund. Because a venture capital fund must know about the technology trends, the technology trend, and the guide to those startups to the, according to technology trends. That, that's why the company can be uh, doing the, as the exit, my mergers acquisition or the IPO, for example. So I think if we do kind of good collaboration to match make the, the joint venture and give them the guideline for technology uh, trend, I think this is gonna be a uh, bring the good uh, source. So we are doing in the, we, are, we have operation in Korea and Japan and Hong Kong, but especially this program is we're doing in Korea, we're doing this source from Korea, accelerating and funding and value adding and exit. But if I can add, if uh, we have in India, there's a huge, tremendous, tremendous good uh, India's companies. So if we match making them right, uh, good companies with a joint venture, this might be a very uh, beneficial for the two countries. Uh, actually, this is one of our bio uh, incubator is in Pangyo, as you see the pictures. So we have uh, seven technology incubators. But so most of technology incubators, our technology incubators, the startups uh, which are entered to our incubators, they, uh, most of them, they are willing to go to the overseas and the global market. That's why they apply to our technology incubators. But uh, also uh, some of them are very, very interested to go to the Indian market as well. So if it, I'm very, very glad to come here and uh, this, uh, this business summit to meet the right partners in the Nigeria. So if you believe make a good bridge between the Korea and India and also Israel, I think that those three countries can be a very uh, fantastic and partners labor. So I see that the India is a population of 1.3 to $4 billion and competitive engineers here and attraction of the global companies. I think when I saw when the review and the those raw materials, I saw very similarity with the Israel. Israel is a very small country, only eight million population there, but you can imagine that there are more than 300 global R&D centers in Israel. But you may think R&D centers are doing only research and development, but it's not anymore. 
research and development is at actually centers, they are doing the mergers acquisition. Before 10 years ago, doing the research and development is uh, very acceptable for the older companies, but now all the conglomerates uh, compete with each other. And R&D in cost a lot, it takes a long time. So they are looking for the, the, to buy the companies doing the mergers acquisitions. So that's why uh, we foreign venture capital fund, Israel venture capital fund, and Nodi, as what the Israeli global companies are looking, looking for and seeking for. So if you match the right way with the Korean technology-based startups and Indian-based startups and with the Israel technology, and those are doing the kind of that joint venture, I think it's going to be a, uh, make the good synergies and in each other. So those are things, uh, the scheme that we built that's going to be very beneficial, beneficial country, that tech-based startups, and for example, Wiseman Institute, Institute from Israel or other universities in Korea and Israel, doing technology transfer and a certain entity and doing the joint R&D about that technology and we are accelerating with the commercialization and doing the localization or India and Korea and the US. And so that's gonna be a very good model that we believe. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, models that I can uh, tell you about that. I'm sure uh, you, you may people use the Waze, for example. Waze is an uh, Israeli navigation uh, app in, in Korea. Our drop fund uh, actually invested in the ways. And at the time, ways started that company. Also, we in Korea has a Korean navigation. We call it Driver Kim. If you download ways or Driver Kim, your app, you will say that, wow, those two uh, apps is uh, so similar together, so common together. Yes, it's totally uh, similar together. But ways company started in very small country in Israel, uh, 8 million people. And uh, driver came actually uh, starting with 50 million. They started in the same time, but how they exited is a different story. Ways they started from the global market. They went to the U.S. market and Euro market. They got a foreign investment, and uh, suddenly, 2013, Ways was sold 1.15 billion dollars by the Google R and Center Israel. But driver came also. Uh, it was a sword, but $56 million by the uh, Korean uh, company in, in Korea. If you see that the difference it is, there is valuation, same company, and that is, I can say the same idea, came from the same ideas, the valuation is totally different. But ways it started as a global market and they doing the globalizations, but uh, the driver came and stayed in the domestic and continued to be in the Korea. So if you make the right partnership, between India and Korea and Israel going together to the global market together, uh, according to global technical trends, I'm sure those three countries are gonna be, uh, can make under the history of the as the start of nations. Thank you very much for hearing us. Send that. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I would now like to call upon Mr. Kim Daijin, President, Global Entrepreneurs Foundation. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm a founder of a uh, president of uh, Global Entrepreneurs Foundation and also publisher of the Entrepreneur newspaper in Korea. Before I came here, my writer has uh, interviewed with several Indian startups, CEOs, accelerators, and association, and has concluded that the two ecosystems should in recovery link together. The ecosystem linkage is what I have termed the Korean startup ecosystem's development as the third way. The first being that in which it is Silicon Valley replica, world-renowned venture capitals, numerous unicorns, highly diverse, etc. And second, China, which has the world's largest amount of venture capital and who starts focus uh, domestically. Much has been said about Korea becoming the Asian Silicon Valley. It is certainly take several years for such a goal to be realized. Korea's startup development and promotion started in earnest in 2013, while Silicon Valley began in the 1950s. Silicon Valley ventures capital in Korea has been few and far between, and while numerous Korean startups have entered Silicon Valley, few have succeeded. 
all the value of our Korea startups getting abundant Chinese investment, investment and venture capital has come to naught. It was only about 3% of total venture capital last year. Likewise, few Korean startups are experiencing enormous success in China. Several Korean startups have entered Southeast Asia, alternatively to China and the Silicon Valley, especially in field of the beauty products and entertainment. Vietnam is the most promising, considering the fact that Indonesia persistently uh, underperforms and the Philippines' political instability, while other Southeastern East Asian nations' markets are undeveloped to what to small. Southeast Asia could eventually be a great market, but its inherent deficiencies vis a vis Korean startups prevent it from being the third way at present. Why India is the an indispensable market for Korean startups? Demographically speaking, India is a startup's Eldorado. Most uh, demographers predict India's population will surpass China's between 2020 and 2024. But what's most telling is more than 50% of its population is below 25. And by 2020, the India's average will be 29 compared to 37 for China and 46 for Korea. Uh, what is more, China and the Korean population will peak in 2025 and are expected to exponentially contract thereafter. India's useful, useful population facilitates demand of, for many Korean startups platforms. Coupled with the world's second fastest growing middle class comes demand for internal and external esteem. As such, middle class uses demand for beauty products, entertainment, uh, etc. India is the second only to China in demand, and at about the same time, its population surpasses China, so too will its smartphone demand. Given India's years of uh, pur purchasing power and internet penetration, it has a lot more future growth potential than any other country, while China will soon reach saturation in demand. With India's rising demand for smartphones comes a huge demand for apps and services. Korea, Korean app startups can meet India's demand and increase profit by entering the Indian market. Institutionally, the Indian central government, similar to Korea's, implemented the Startup India initiative. It provides tax breaks, improved bankrupt laws, etc. It pays in the amount of seed funding Korea's problem. But more importantly, India, like Korea, has proclaimed startups as its future growth engine. Why Korea is a tech test based global market for Indian startups? According to the wider report, India has many problems with development, and the Korean startups can help with development. For example, have we heard startup DOT, DOT? They visited India last year to introduce their platform to India. They have a platform that helps blind people read, and India presently has the most blind people in the world. According to the Startups India, on overview report 2015 of Assocham India, 4,300, totally about 10,000 startups were tech-based startup, startup. And their technologies were e-commerce, 33%, B2B, 24%, consumer internet, 12%, mobile apps, 10%, SAS, 8%, which are almost matching to Korean strong tech area. Korea may have the largest smartphone penetration per capita globally, so many of Chinese mobile-based tech startups have used the Korean market as a test bed for new technology. Indian startups also can do similar. Finally, we are the most innovative in the world, synergy effect of Indian and the Korean technology. Today morning, Minister Shiri Suresh Prabhu suggested Korea to grow Indian startups globally. Yes, we can do it together. In order to make such a synergy effect practically, in its first stage, I suggest three plus one programs between accelerators in India and Korea, three months in Korea and India, and one in other countries. In this regard, I ask Indian and Korean government and uh, corporates to support this program financially, and then both startup ecosystem will get 
So if financial growth and the third way against Silicon Valley or China ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would now like to call upon Mr. Rajan Navnani, Chairman CII Future Business Council and Managing Director Jetline Group of Companies to share insights on the future of services. A very good afternoon to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the entire Korean delegation that has uh, been here in Delhi, and I met several of you, and I know many of you came in either last night, this morning, and I think in the midst of catching up with India, you've had a, a very interesting day and session uh, here on what is the potential of the India and Korea relationship. But what I, you know, wonder is that why one of the most exciting opportunities, which is really innovation and technology, is being discussed towards the end of the day <laughs> when, you know, we've already heard so many things. But uh, uh, I think, to me, the most exciting opportunity that our two countries uh, face is really the opportunity to collaborate, and not only collaborate with each other, but to collaborate with each other for the world uh, in the areas of technology and innovation. Uh, you know, many, very often we kind of uh, combine the two words of technology and innovation as means if there's technology, you know, that's the innovation. But I think, uh, you know, the topic that I'm going to be talking about is on the future of services. I think at the cross-section of the technological innovation comes the ability to be able to create sustainable business models, disruptive models, uh, service models that can enhance the value of that innovation. And I think, uh, you know, we've begun to see a lot of this happening uh, around the world. Many a times the innovation itself uh, is not where the value gets created. It's about what emerges as an opportunity for services as an outcome of that, that really enables you to extract revenue out of that, you know, value that has been created. Uh, I think in our industries very often we uh, when we talk innovation, we will say invention. But I think invention was probably the internet, but the number of businesses that, you know, that services got created as an outcome of just the wireless internet is, is unbelievable. And the value that has been created globally. I mean, even Zuckerberg is a, uh, you know, Facebook is an outcome of that. So I think when we really look at uh, what has happened and what is shaping the world, uh, you know, we can talk of mobility, cloud, and, um, you know, the entire big data revolution and artificial intelligence all coming together. But really at the core of all of this is that the way a consumer is interacting or exercising their choices, buying products, buying services has changed rapidly. And I think the moment we recognize that, I think there's again a humongous opportunity to cater to that consumer again in a differentiated manner. Uh, so while, you know, we say that the services opportunity uh, globally uh, you know, is, is, is limited in certain ways, uh, you know, uh, compared to uh, the manufacturing and even from an employability perspective, uh, my take is significantly different, at least in the future. Uh, as we see the future, and, you know, CII has taken a pioneering initiative of forming a future business council, working very closely with the Ministry of Commerce and Industry to see how India, and, you know, our minister this morning also mentioned uh, that how can India create a trillion dollar economy out of that five trillion dollar uh, using future and new age businesses that are actually, some of them are there and some of them will even emerge over the next few years and we know very little of what that combination will come. And I, I'd like to, you know, argue that a lot of that would be led through a method of services uh, that will, you know, kind of drive that. If you really look at you know, businesses today, or even you look at any product or manufactured product, I think the servitization of that product is really what is creating value. I mean, you know, Korea manufactures some of the best elevators, the best, you know, so many products. Uh, but very often when you're competing globally, the pricing on that is very limited, but the AMC or the annual maintenance contract on the services is where the business eventually, you know, gets its bottom lines. And I see that 
the servitization of products actually uh, you know exponentially increasing particularly as manufacturing becomes efficient and competitive uh, you know automation is playing a great role uh, so if you really look at where manufacturing is headed today uh, I mean there's always going to be a debate when you're hiring right am I going to hire a machine or I'm going to get a man uh, you know there is going to be that competitive level and as machines get smarter and they start talking to each other they're going to see an elimination of a lot of you know human interaction in the manufacturing process but therein lies a massive opportunity for that same human then to come in and you know use that manufactured product to deliver an outcome or a service uh, to people so personally like you know and even as a body as the way we are looking at it we see the growth of services particularly in the disruptive world that we live in today uh, to be potentially uh, very significant you know, we always talked about uh, software as a service, right, in India and all. You know, I think the time has come and we're seeing a lot of it where even a product is being used as a service. I mean, the best example of that is Uber. I mean, earlier, you know, you had one car and you had, you know, one consumer. Today, one car is catering to so many more people and the revenue models and the employability, the, the product has not only become the car, the product has become the car and the driver coming together. Right? And that product is now delivering a service. I mean, so I'm just trying to, you know, position a view when we are taking a take on the future and we are seeing that we're going to be part of this sharing economy, we're going to be part of this world that is going to be driven by such innovations. Really, what role can, you know, India and Korea play? And really, uh, where is India, you know, particularly uh, in this journey? And where do we see a large part of this uh, opportunity, you know, coming in? Uh, for India. I think in India particularly there lies a multi-trillion dollar opportunity not only for us as a country but for India to really take services out to the world and you know we can go down a whole list I have a whole list of areas in which you know services can be applicable you take skills education financial services healthcare IT next-gen cities take each of these examples and if you were to look at four very large vision statements that our Prime Minister has made. Uh, make in India, Skill India, Digital India, Startup India. Just look at these four pillars as the drivers of where, you know, the convergence amongst the four will lead to a business ecosystem in the future. I mean, let's just take healthcare, right? India is probably the best deliverer of uh, frugal healthcare in terms of machines etc right I mean we'll create the lowest cost of equipment if we look at digital India we talk of telemedicine we talk of methods to deliver that if we look at skill India the vocational training that goes into healthcare there's a huge demand for nursing around the world right how do we skill our people to really get there the startup India I mean I was at a panel I mean at a uh, trying to identify the most innovative uh, company uh, innovative company in the state of Maharashtra there was a jury and the honorable chief minister did recently out of all the companies 40 percent of the companies were healthcare companies so the startup ecosystem now all four of them working together and we can take that in in every area you look at next-gen cities as cities change with solid waste and that the number of services you can provide in smart cities in its in an ecosystem is is excellent so I think you know the list goes on telecom logistics retail e-commerce space railway service professional services <laughs> the way we see it I think we have to reimagine you know traditional services we have to totally and completely you know reimagine how uh, services will you know uh, ultimately play out and you know the last point I'd like to make is that you know this morning uh, someone mentioned that you know in, in, a, in a minute we sell or we have in India you know seven refrigerators from Korea one car God knows how many mobile phones imagine when all of them talk to each other in a home you know uh, just the courier influence to be able to deliver services in India uh, is, an, is, a, is a bed which will create employability and jobs and if we were to actually match India and Korea together I think the potential of what uh, we can achieve together globally um, is, is massive and I uh, thank everyone for for being here and uh, it's been a pleasure uh, you know hosting all of you here thank you very much
Thank you, Mr. Nabdani. I would now like to request Mr. P.S. Jai Kumar, Managing Director and CEO of Bank of Baroda, to kindly join us for sharing insights on financing for startups. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and a particular warm welcome to our friends in Korea. Uh, I've already been told to be as fast as I can, but my presentation is largely directed to our Korean friends. I want to talk about four things. Uh, the, the startup background in a few words. I want to talk about the range of financing options that's available for startups in India. I would like to talk about the Korean participation in the Indian startup. And finally, I want to talk about a bit if you have time on Bank of Baroda and what we are doing in this space. Now, India has obviously witnessed a tremendous and a phenomenal progress in startup. It's been technology dominated, fintech dominated, but over a period of time, it's extended to various sectors such as robotics, analytics, edutech, health tech, fin fintech, etc. The total valuation of the companies that have been recently set up in the last seven to ten years is estimated to be about 32 billion. In the last year alone, 13.7 7 billion have been invested in the Indian ecosystem. As was discussed earlier in the morning, a combination of Korea's hardware together with India's software can make a significant difference. When we think about financing of startups in India, there's a whole range available, both in terms of the instrumentalities that are available, in terms of the investors or lenders, investors that are available. So where we have uh, crowdfunding at an early stage, but still available, we have 300 angel investors who have made over 820 investments so far. We have 280 incubators, business incubators and accelerators that are helping many companies, many startups to be able to bring the product to market and raise money. We have also, the largest financing is obviously coming from venture capital, three-fourths of the 13.7 billion that came last year went through venture capital. We have venture debt funds that are there, and Bank of Baroda is a large contributor to many of the venture debt funds, approximately about $500 million today. In addition to that, there are bank loans uh, that are available. Now, obviously, with the Prime Minister as the most uh, significant sponsor of Startup India, the government programs are also many. There are as many as 50 programs of the government of various sorts that are here to support uh, the startup companies, including some of them worth mentioning, the Artel Incubation Center, the Artel Tinkering Labs, what is offered by the National Science and Technology Management Information System, the DIPP Startup India, and Startup Assistance Scheme of SIDBI. Now, there's a 1.5 billion fund that has been allocated by the government of India, out of which 92 million has been dispersed to over 75 startup companies through investing of this being channelized by SIDBI into AIF. The government has also put together a number of uh, programs around tax benefits to make such investments effective, including tax exemption of income tax for three years and a 2,000 crore credit guarantee fund. Different states, in addition to that, have their own own, own programs, there are startup programs of Karnataka, Maharashtra, Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, etc. So I think we are in a, in a fairly vibrant environment. But what also is distinguishing is that India has got, in its own way, a, a, a startup financing with respect to focus with financial inclusion in its mind. We have a program called Stand Up India, where we finance people from 50,000 to 150,000. These are customers who are from the non-organized sector or the less organized sector. And we have the Pradhan Mantri micro unit development and refinance agency called Mudra and Mudra based loans that are also targeted at, uh, as a pass of financial inclusion to people who may not necessarily have access to formal finance. So far, under that program, over $70 billion have been financed. And the current year, the government's expectation is $45 billion more will be lent out. So in, uh, but as we think about Korea and India in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of what is happening, the startup investment in, in India is largely dominated by the Japanese and Chinese investors. 19 Japanese investors participated in $2.3 billion in the last two years. SoftBank is the most well-known uh, investor in this country with many blockbuster success. The Chinese investors through Tencent, Alibaba, C-Trip have also become one of the largest uh, investors in startups. A Korean investment on the country is less known, and therefore I think there is an opportunity over here uh, for Korean, Korean Korea to think in terms of investing in startups in India. Finally, a few words on Bank of Baroda. Uh, we do have a 
uh, a fairly robust uh, uh, program around identifying entrepreneurs. We run, um, we run, for example, uh, hackathons in which we identify uh, identify people who can come with solutions for a banking business, and then we structure the transaction in a manner that they can get realization from capital market rather than paying them a fees for their activity. We pay them on per step, per transaction basis, so there is there is actually a model for them to go back to the capital market and raise money. Uh, we're doing a number of things in terms of working with a number of people in terms of developing product, proof of concepts, etc. We finance, we have a partnership with over 15 fintech companies in a variety of space from alternative data lending, wealth management, trade finance, blockchain, etc. We're also very highly focused with respect to agri-tech startup in a number of areas considering procuring farm machinery, access to high quality inputs, financing against uh, warehouse, etc. We have, or in the process of setting up uh, a Bob Bank of Boda Innovation Center, we've been speaking to several Korean partners, or possibility to partner with it, and that center would act as a single point for infrastructure, mentoring, networking, and building, bringing people to the ecosystem, Korean startup companies in India, and simultaneously work on a similar opportunity for Indian startup companies uh, to work in Korea. Uh, so that broadly is what I would like to uh, summarize my, uh, my presentation that this is an area of tremendous opportunity, and I think the two countries can work together and to do a lot more, and institutions like us are actively working for framework and partners uh, to, to move forward in this area. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would like to thank all the panelists for joining us today and sharing such valuable insights. We shall now move on to the next segment of the session, which is a panel discussion. I request esteemed dignitaries on the dais to kindly take their seats in the reserved area. Mr. Padmanabhan, can I request you to join us for a group photo? Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to invite my panelists for the next session, which is a panel discussion on advancing Indian technology and innovation landscape engaging with Startup India ecosystem. I would like to call upon stage Mr. Prabhat Gosai in West India, Mr. Anil Agarwal, Joint Secretary, Department of Senior Foreign Council, California, Attorneys at Law, Yulchon. Sri R. Ramanan, Mission Director, Atal Innovation Mission, and Mr. Abhishek Maitri, Founder, Car PM. Thank you for joining us. I request uh, Mr. Prabhat Kusain to kindly take the proceedings further. I'm audible? Hello, yeah. So thank you, uh, Neha. And uh, I know it's a little late in the day, but uh, you've got to bear with us for another 15, 20 minutes. We've got a very interesting set of panelists with us uh, for this interesting session on advancing Indian technology and innovation landscape. 
engaging with the startup India ecosystem. So we've heard a lot about what the government is doing uh, in terms of promoting and engaging with startups. I'll quickly introduce our panelists uh, to our audience. Mr. Anil Agrawal, who's sitting right next to me, is the Joint Secretary of Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion and uh, works on uh, the Startup India campaign from the Government of India's side. Uh, he has been credited with many initiatives taken at district and state level. Uh, one interesting story that he told me right before entering uh, uh, stage was that he initiated a program called UP100 uh, with the government of UP, which was his idea of startup and disrupting the government ecosystem, which impacted uh, one lakh seven thousand villages and is the largest emergency response system uh, in the world. It has uh, average police dispatches of fifteen thousand uh, cars per day uh, in, in the state of Uttar Pradesh. That's his own startup uh, in India. Mr. Chung Tong Su is a senior foreign counsel uh, attorney is at law Yulchon. Uh, he has uh, been a counsel at Yulchon focusing on corporate law, international trade and investment, cross-border dispute resolution. It is one of the largest uh, full service law firms in Korea. Until uh, March 2010, Mr. Chung served as the head of Invest Korea, uh, which is Korea's foreign direct investment promotion agency and was credited with bringing in $10, $10 billion of FDI every year into South Korea. So welcome, Mr. Chung. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Mr. Ramanan, uh, thank you, sir, for joining us. He's the mission director of Patel Innovation Mission of Niti Aayog uh, and is uh, tasked with the uh, challenge of uh, promoting an innovation uh, and technology from right from the grassroots level. Mr. Ramanan uh, was earlier the managing director and CEO of uh, CMC Limited, which is a subsidiary of the Tata Consultancy Services. And in a career spanning over 35 years, uh, he has built the India's IT sector from ground up, working with the Tata, Tata Consultancy Services. To add a little bit uh, of flavor to the session, we have invited an early stage startup with us. Abhishek Mathri joins us from Car PM. Uh, Abhishek is the co-founder of Car PM, which, which is an application that makes cars smarter and safer and less polluting, all using data and analytics and machine learning. Uh, earlier, he has been a product manager at 1MG, which is another leading healthcare startup in India. Because of the paucity of time, I'll jump straight to you know uh, the questions that I wish to pick uh, the brains of my fellow panelists with. And I wish to start with you, Mr. Ramanan. You know, we have all heard that creativity and innovation start right from the school level. And uh, as a student grows up to the college stage, there are some basic resources like lab equipments, uh, some some seed grant in terms of research facilities and, and also research stipend that are available to students for tinkering with their ideas. So how is your program of the Atal Innovation Mission uh, working towards creating an engaging innovation ecosystem right up from the grassroots level in India? And how do you think this ties up in the larger scheme of things where we're actually focusing on building an innovation-driven economy uh, to be a part of the global uh, marketplace, so to speak? Your thoughts, sir? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me an opportunity to be part of this uh, very uh, important event and also for the question. Um, as as uh, some of you know, Atal Innovation Mission is a national initiative by the Prime Minister of the country. And it is to promote innovation and entrepreneurship across the length and breadth of the country. And it has taken a very holistic approach for ensuring that an ecosystem of innovation is created. And the holistic approach is operating at three levels. One, at the school level, how do you ensure that we create an innovative mindset and a problem-solving mindset in the school students who are uh, going to be the job creators for tomorrow? The second is, how are you going to do it at a university and higher academic institutions uh, level? Uh, and the third is at the industry level for both uh, SME sector as well as the private sector. Um, so this is... Uh, the approach that the Atal Innovation Mission has taken to ensure that innovation and entrepreneurship can be promoted and can be scaled up at each of these levels across the country. So the Atal Tinkering Labs is uh, the initiative at the school level. What we're doing is we are setting up thousands of labs, which are latest tinkering labs with the latest of technologies like 3D printers, robotics, IoT, do-it-yourself kits, miniaturized electronics, augmented virtual reality, and so on so that students from grade six to grade 12 are able to play with them, tinker with them, 
A number of challenges are posed to them called Atal Tinkering Challenges every month. And we run several tinkering fests and tinkering marathons where problems are, are put forward to the, uh, to the school children or to the students. They leverage the technology to create real solutions, real world solutions. And when we pose the challenges, we tell the children, you have to go and engage with the community, identify specific problems associated with the larger challenge. For example, waste management or uh, Swachh Bharat, which is uh, waste management or uh, universal drinking water for all or smart mobility and so on. And when we pose a particular challenge in a particular sector, the students go out, identify a specific point challenge, create a solution and submit it. And in the recently held uh, marathon that we held, a tinkering marathon across India, uh, more than 35,000 students participated, creating innovations, more than 6,000 innovations. And the top 100 have got recognized by uh, an esteemed panel of judges across the country, and they are really top class. So much so that some of them are being considered to be potential startup uh, associations, and we are associating them with startups and incubators across the country so that you can take this idea further and create an engineer a product out of it. So we have already established 2,500 schools across the country with adult tinkering labs. And before the end of this year, we will have more than 5,000 schools uh, with adult tinkering labs spanning all the districts, the 700 districts that we have in the country, all the 32 states and the union territories and so on. The second intervention that the Atal Innovation Mission is doing is we are setting up incubators, world-class incubators in higher academic engineering institutions or science institutions or even private sector and small and medium business uh, uh, companies. So these incubators will foster startups which are of uh, national uh, need and they will create an ecosystem where the startups can be supported, whether it is venture capital support, mentoring support, uh, engineering research lab or technical access support and so on. So for this we are giving a grant of up to 10 crores for each successful applicant and these 10 crores can be used to set up the required ecosystem, the required infrastructure and the required research labs in order to facilitate the success of the startup because the startups can't afford them. The third intervention that we are doing is we are setting up, we are launching what are known as Atal New India Challenges. And these New India Challenges are point product innovation intervention so that uh, the um, organizations which respond to it can get a grant of up to one crore for creating product innovation. And this is where we are looking at collaborations between Indo-Korean Indo startups or even other uh, organizations so that you can bring together the best of minds to solve the problem. And finally, to support all of this, we are setting up a large mentoring network called Mentor India Network across the country. More than 5,000 persons have registered on this network and they would be associated with the tinkering labs with the uh, uh, incubators, with the startups. So it's a very holistic approach which will ensure that, and not only are we creating uh, innovative mindset in students, uh, both at the university school level, but also creating the necessary ecosystem for spawning product innovation across the country. Thank you, sir, for uh, sharing your thoughts on the incubation mission and the innovation mission as a broader scheme of things. Uh, Mr. Ramanan has to Unfortunately, leave for a meeting at 5. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. Uh, uh, we really appreciate you sparing time for this session. Thank you. So my next, uh, the next thought that I want to uh, probe is out of Mr. Anil uh, Agrawal, who is uh, leading the startup campaign uh, from the government side. Sir, uh, government is laying strong emphasis on encouraging startups to drive uh, innovation-led growth of India's economy. And uh, as we all know, our prime minister is really keen on promoting startups to be an even uh, integrated part of our uh, economic value chain. Seeing, we are seeing this with the Startup India program that a lot of incentives like tax breaks, uh, financial incentives, and a host of other benefits are being offered to startups in India. From the perspective of today's summit, uh, are there any dedicated initiatives under the program where we are engaging with other countries to promote startups and innovations and also facilitating exchange between uh, nations on a more G2G level? And do you think India can become uh, a stronger part of the global innovation economy by sort of promoting such country-to-country -country partnerships? Thank Your you, thoughts, Subhash. First of all, I want to make it clear that Startup India program is not just about tax breaks. It's, it's a comprehensive uh, 
strategy designed to develop the overall uh, startup ecosystem. The vision of the Prime Minister is very clear. He wants to have startups in every districts and every block of the country. Now that is the kind of vision for which we are working. Now let me just go over uh, basic features of the Startup India benefits that you have. You have an idea, you want to register, and the moment you register, you see there are certain compliances that are easier for you. So six labor laws, there are three environmental laws. You can self-certify for compliances. You have uh, issues of uh, protection of the intellectual property. So we have 1,000, almost a list of 1,000 IP facilitators. Those services are provided free of cost to the startups. When you file for a patent, 80% of the fees is exempt. When you file for a trademark, 50% of the fees is exempt. So it is not just about tax breaks. When you start uh, uh, raising funds, angel funds, above the fair market value, that they are fully exempt. Then you, when, you, when you start making money, when you start uh, uh, having operations and you start making uh, uh, incomes from uh, income within your own startup, you, you get ex exemptions for three years. So this is the overall thing. Then when you start ultimately exiting the startup ecosystem, you, we want you to get into a big company, get into PE funds. And even if uh, there is a failure and you have to exit, there is a shorter time period of 90 days. So it is the Startup India program is all about, you know, a complete from uh, end to end. It is a support system which uh, gives. In terms of funding, we don't actually directly fund. We fund, we have fund of funds and then uh, through a bank we uh, do the funding and that actually multiplies the funds available for the startup. Now, so far as international engagements are concerned, we are actually open to government to government interventions. We have uh, MOUs with uh, Sweden, Portugal. We have a very successful event with Israel. I would like to mention that, you know, it is called Indo-Israel Innovation Bridge. The Prime Minister of India and the Prime Minister of Israel, they inaugurated this program. How was the whole program conducted? We identified three areas of working. One is agriculture, second is water, and third is digital health. Because it was thought that Israeli system has a lot of expertise in these areas. We have a lot of issues in these areas where we could leverage either each other's capabilities. So we had these three areas, we identified two problem statements in each of these three areas. These challenges were run over the Startup India Hub program. We got 665 applications from India. There were about 200 applications from Israel. These applications were evaluated and we have, in each of these six areas, we have identified three winners. So we have 18 winners from India, we have 18 winners from Israel. All of them are now going through a six month incubation program. And then at the end of the incubation program, we are thinking of more market access to them and further support that can be done. So this is a kind of program that can be done with South Korea as well. We have uh, uh, interest from Singapore, we have interest from ASEAN, we have other programs. Formal engagements, we, we can have formal engagement with South Korean uh, uh, startups. However, if somebody is looking at only the Indian market, you have technology, you have IP, and if you are looking only at the Indian market for its size, probably then we'll have to have a level playing field. We would like to be as much a partner and develop localized solutions to our issues, having equal rights on IPs, rather than giving only the market access to foreign uh, startups. This is what I would like to say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, shedding more light on our international engagements. In fact, one of the programs that I found really interesting uh, was the uh, Indo-ASEAN challenge, where I think Startup India ecosystem has partnered with ASEAN countries to 
you know, uh, launched their products and innovations with state governments in India, which was really interesting. So we hope that it scales up in the future. We hope uh, we do similar things with South Korea as well and also the other countries uh, in the coming future. Uh, to Mr. Uh, Chung, uh, I think uh, he has spared his valuable time uh, for participating. Uh, I, I just want to understand, uh, sir, that in today's industry, 4.0 scenario as uh, is being projected, uh, technologies like artificial intelligence and robotics uh, and efficient automation, machine learning are taking forefront of manufacturing setups all across the globe as well. So how are South Korean corporate uh, sort of uh, plays in their uh, strategies to engage deeply with startups all across the world and more so the technology startups uh, to sort of accelerate their own technology development and you know deliver solutions in a more uh, robust manner. Uh, sir, your thoughts on that? Thank you. Namaste. We're almost at the end of a long day. Uh, looks like I lost most of my compatriots from Korea in the, in the audience. Uh, thanks for hanging, hanging in there. I first came to this part of the world in 1979 when I was working for the World Bank and I made my first trip to Dhaka, Bangladesh and Chittagong. Uh, my first trip to India was in 1998. At that time, I was working for the United States Department of Commerce at International Trade Administration, working to help the American companies' interests in trade and investment. Uh, and then over the last 10 years, I made three more trips. Uh, in in uh, 10 years ago, 28, 2008, when I was working as the head of Invest Korea, and then four years ago, when the former president, Ms. Park, came, I uh, also came with her, and now this is my fifth trip to India. I spent the last uh, weekend in uh, Visakhapatnam attending the partnership uh, summit in Andhra Pradesh, very impressive forum. And today, uh, you've heard from a number of uh, uh, businessmen and government leaders about the synergies that uh, we have. Um, and I do believe that there is a, a lot of complementarity between Korea and India uh, in terms of technology. Uh, and, and it's almost like a match made in heaven between Korean uh, hardware prowess and Indian software strength. And I want to uh, tell you about a uh, specific case that I know because I think uh, a success story makes a, a good impact. And so if you can put, a, put up a, a slide of a company that I know, and this is an effort engaged by a, a Samsung, a Samsung uh, Electronics, you all know, is a major technology leader in the world and the largest Korean company. And it has been making special efforts to uh, work with Indian startups. It has uh, created a fund to fund uh, Indian startups. And as you know, it employs a large number of Indians, uh, engineers in, in other capacity, I think uh, well over 1,000. They have R&D center in, in, in India as well as in Korea and around the world. It uh, employs a large number of Indian uh, engineers. And one of the uh, spin-offs that uh, that grew up from uh, Samsung. It uh, was spun off uh, early last year. Is, uh, can you put up this uh, slide? I still don't have it. <coughs> um, yeah, it's a company called Tech Hive. Uh, next page, please. And it's, it's uh, CEO is an Indian called Pankaj Agarwal. Uh, he is an IIT graduate from Kanpur. Uh, he also got a master's in electrical engineering and computer sciences from Seoul National University and an MBA from Harvard while working for Samsung Engineering. Uh, the company sent him to Harvard to get his MBA. And at Personally for us, we missed out on that by a few months. We were incorporated in March, in May 2015, so we missed out on that by about nine, 10 months. Uh, but apart from income tax as well, very few of the companies make any profit in the initial years. 
So if we had something around probably GST, I'm just throwing ideas here, probably some concession around GST, uh, probably for the first three years you don't have to file it because 18% just eats up into your profit margin. So that's, that's one thing that we could do. Uh, to be honest, after GST, tax-wise, not a lot of complaints. One tax, very easy to file. Uh, there's not a lot of confusion here. And you guys already have a cell that, 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 that's a dedicated team of CAs that actually helps you in all that. Uh, one major point, and this is something that we had personal experience with. So before our panel, there was uh, Mr. Jay Kumar who spoke about how venture capital is one of the biggest sources of funding for Indian startups. Uh, now, I know that Startup India has a, a partnership with Union Bank, where in early stage uh, companies can get uh, loans up to 10 lakhs, I think, with no collateral. Uh, I think this is one area that really needs to be expanded upon, uh, because not every startup in the country will be a tech startup. People will have invented led models, people will set probably bags or shoes or something else. So if we have easier modes of debt funding, probably with less, uh, I don't know, less overhead or uh, with no collateral requirements, I think that would give a boon uh, to particularly the tier two and tier three entrepreneurs who right now do not have access to venture capital, do not have the network. So if we had a greater network of debt funding or probably s some kind of regulation or some kind of uh, mandate from the government, I think that'd be super helpful. Uh, right, uh, there is also, a ma okay, I'm taking this into a really uh, Startup India specific context. Uh, but I think that does does to the panel here. We have another, uh, I won't say mandate, but there is another, uh, some kind of regulation for the companies that you have to consider startups for your tenders as well. I think this is, uh, this is some kind of communication that has gone on to uh, most PSUs or uh, government-led bodies that if you have a tender, uh, then you will waive off the requirements uh, for minimum revenue or X numbers of years of experience so that startups get a link, uh, level, level playing field with the other corporates. So this is superb. Uh, the only thing that we can add here is probably more information again. We simply don't know when a government tender has been released. So if there was some kind of uh, medium or a corridor, I think there might already be, but if there is something that can be done here, that will again be very helpful. Now last, you spoke about uh, applying for patents, applying for trademarks. We have personally done that. And yes, uh, we did get a fee waiver and it was really helpful. Uh, the only thing is, and which, which is outside uh, of what Startup India can control. Now, even if we apply for a patent and it's very easy, we will always prefer to apply in the US, not in India, because enforceability there is high. In India, patent enforceability is horrendously low. Even if you hold multiple patents, uh, there, is, there is very little you can do about them. Whereas in the US, in the UK, uh, there is enforceability. If you work with corporates there, uh, the kind of contracts that you see around uh, patent enforceability around IP protection, those are of another level altogether. So yeah, uh, this is broadly it from our side. Uh, I think uh, with, with Startup India, we have thousands of startups now being certified. We were, I think, around 30, 300 to one. But yes, it's been super helpful. I was sharing with Mr. Agarwal as well that we had some personal experiences where they were very helpful. Uh, but yes, these are the four or five areas where if we get some help, I think we can we can get to another level. It's amazing. Uh, thank you, Abhishek, uh, for sharing your thoughts. I think uh, that comprehensively sums it up. Uh, all the benefits, all the initiatives, uh, all the incentives, all the help that startups in India get these days, especially from a government standpoint. Uh, some of the numbers that you quoted, uh, 3,300 recognized startups. I think it's uh, 7,000 plus startups which have been recognized by the IPP Government of India, uh, search team. Uh, which is basically uh, one third of the entire ecosystem. We have 22,000 plus startups in India now, out of which 5,400 are tech-enabled startups. And uh, you know, in terms of knowledge aggregation and uh, dissemination, you know, to the right uh, target audience, uh, we have built a dedicated portal called the Startup India Hub, which will be you know uh, the one-stop shop portal for all requirements uh, related to startups, whether it's connecting with investors or connecting with other startups or connecting with suppliers, manufacturers, etc. Uh, uh, that is also there. Uh, also, that you, the point that you mentioned on uh, you know, startups getting benefited from tier two and tier three cities, uh, we are also going down to all parts, all blocks of the country, which is the vision of our prime minister uh, through the mode of Startup India Yatra, where we actually hand off uh, incubation offers to the most innovative idea pitches that come from our uh, boot camps and workshops. So most recently, sir, as you would be uh, sort of aware, uh, we've done 
this yatra in Odisha, uh, where uh, 10 districts uh, the Startup India team went to and handed incubation offers in excess of 110, which is like 110 new potential startups in country just identified from the grassroots level. So imagine if this scales up to all districts, all parts, all state, uh, states of the country, how big an ecosystem we could form now. Uh, we're imagining an ecosystem of 100,000 plus startups, sir, by 2025. And with all the feedback and inputs uh, from our stakeholders, from our country partnerships, from our state partnerships, from state startup policies, from national incentives, I think we are more than uh, uh, enabled on our path to become the $5 trillion digital economy by 2025 that we have envisioned uh, as a dream for new India. Thank you so much, all of you who have spared time uh, to listen to us today. And I'd, thank, I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists, uh, Shreyan Lagrawalji, uh, Chung Tong Su, sir, and uh, Abhishek to you especially, and also Mr. Ramanan who joined us uh, some time ago. Thank you, have a really good day, and special thanks to our uh, friends from Korea who have made this trip so far. We hope you have a good time in India. I'd like to hand over uh, to Neha to uh, hand over the vote of thanks to our audience. Thank you. With the hope that this India-Korea Business Summit will strengthen the bond between the two countries and forge new ties, we would like to draw the session and summit proceedings to a close. On behalf of DIPP and Confederation of Indian Industry, our partners Chosin Ilbu, Invest India and Kotra, I thank you all for joining us today. I would like to extend a special thank to our event partners Bank of Baroda, Hyundai, LG, Mahindra and Gita, who made this event possible. I would like to extend a heartfelt gratitude to members from the Korean delegation and Indian industry for participating in the summit and being such a great audience. Thank you. All the best. is another perfect day to chase the impossible.